just want to say, first of all, I miss you guys out there. One thing I've said, and I think you guys know about me, I love church. I love Sunday school. I love teaching. So I really do miss it. I think some people, when, when there's not church uh, or Sunday school or whatever it may be, I think there's some people that are like, hey, I'm kind of glad, you know, it's a day off from church. I don't like a day off. I heard somebody say one time, we've been delivered from Sunday night church. I thought, I don't want to be delivered from Sunday night church. But anyway, we're going to get into the class this morning again. We're at a different place than we are uh, on the podcast. So we'll just uh, pick up where we left off last week. We're in 1 Kings uh, chapter 13, verse 10. So this is talking about if you, again, you might have to backtrack. You might have to go back and read the story up to this point because of where we start each week. But this is when uh, the prophet met Jeroboam on the road. And this is not the Ahijah the prophet that we've talked about in the past. We don't really know who this prophet was. It doesn't really name him. There's speculation, but it doesn't matter to us. But anyway, this prophet has come along and uh, is, has talked to Jeroboam. And so if you, if you read prior to that, the guy says, uh, I'm supposed to deliver this message. This is where uh, Jeroboam's hand shriveled up and the guy healed his hand or God healed his hand through the prophet. All those kind of things to set this up. And, and so the guy was told not to, not to stay there. In other words, he was told, bring this message, uh, give the message to Jeroboam and go home. That was the, the message. Don't stay. It's a sinful place. You don't need to stay. There's no purpose for you being there other than just to give the message. So in verse 10, it says, So he took another road and did not return by the way he had come from Bethel. So it's talking about he had no food, no drink there, and not to go back by the same road. He took a different road back. So those he had been obedient to exactly what God had told him to do. So, verse 11, Now there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel whose sons came and told him all that the man of God had done there that day. They also told their father what he had said to the king. Again, we don't know the name for sure of, uh, of who this prophet was. It just says an old prophet living in Bethel. And we'll find out that, that this prophet actually does... Um, he does some good things. He's like some of these other guys. He does some good things. He prophesies some good things. He's probably known as a good prophet, but he also gets some of his own self-motivation and uh, does some wrong things in, in all of this. So just because a person has the title of pastor, prophet, teacher, whatever it may be, does not mean uh, that God has found such favor with them because they're so perfect that God chose to uh, use them. I, I've heard people say one of the questions uh, in a church service, we believe in the prophetic here. We believe in tongues and interpretation here. And I've heard people say, well, why would God use that person to give an interpretation? They're not really like one of the more spiritual people in the church. Like we think it should be one of the godly men or the godly women of the church. And I, one of the explanations I thought was kind of blunt one time, it said maybe there was none of the holy people that were willing. Maybe there's none of the holy people that had prepared themselves. Like, And God said, you know, I'll use whatever I have to use to get the message across. And so, so in this case, whether this guy at, at this particular time is a good guy, bad guy, whatever, God uses him in the prophetic but he also gives him strict instructions about what he's supposed to do and what he's not supposed to do in this case. So uh, some of the things, what he, he shouldn't have done, if he was a godly man, he shouldn't have been living in an idolatrous town. You know, we talked about last week, I'm sure we call Vegas Sin City, that was part of the podcast, we call it Sin City. It, you know, it's not necessarily a sin for a pastor to live in Vegas. There's Assembly God churches in Vegas. They're good things, but you don't live in, a, in those times. You don't live in a town that is full of idolatry and those, or you don't live, I guess I should say, among the people that, uh, that are like that. Probably if you were a pastor uh, in, in Vegas, it probably wouldn't be appropriate to live in the same apartment building as 
the strippers, the casino, I mean, those kind of things. You, you need to keep yourself some distance in those things. So he lived in an idolatrous town. Uh, his sons attended idolatrous worship. Uh, they were telling uh, the man, uh, he was telling the man of God a premeditated lie, which we're going to see in this. The good part, whether he, if he was a good prophet, he was called an old prophet. In other words, there should have been respect for him as someone who had been around. He's not a new guy that just says, hey, I, I'm, I've got this word from God. I think we would be very careful in this church, uh, not that we want to stifle anything that, that God is saying, but I think we'd have to be very careful in this church if someone came in and began to give a message in tongues or prophecy or something like that, not knowing them, if that prophecy was a little bit off of the what the Word of God says, we would probably put a stop to that. And so uh, this, uh, whether he's the good prophet, the bad prophet, he was an old prophet, so he was a known prophet, in other words. Um, he, had, he showed respect to the man of God. He's talking about this uh, other prophet that had been here. We don't know the names of either one of these guys. But he had sent word to the man of God. He showed respect for the man of God. Uh, he realized that there was something about, uh, uh, or something, he was an old prophet, known as an old prophet in the church. So he, was, he also said uh, about this other prophet, he wanted to bury him in his own grave, and we'll read that in the scripture to come. And he told his sons to bury him with the old prophet. So, uh, so there's some good things about him. There's some things that aren't, aren't so good uh, about him. Verse uh, 12 through 15, Their father asked them which way did he go, and his sons showed him which road the man of God from Judah had taken. So he said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. And when they had saddled the donkey for him, he mounted it and rode after the man of God. He found him sitting under an oak tree and asked, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? I am, he replied. Um, so the prophet said to him, Come home with me and eat. So, the, the Targum, which is part of the Jewish uh, commentary, calls him a false prophet in this uh, sense. So, what he's about to do, the things he's about to do here, he's called a false prophet. So, he says, come home with me and eat. He had already been told not to eat or drink anything in that city. And, and I had to think, Sometimes it's very easy to obey God when it's easy. It's harder to obey God when it begins to get rough. So for this guy, maybe it was easy. Maybe he wasn't hungry when he went there. It was easy when God said, don't eat anything there, don't drink anything there, don't go back by the same road. Those were pretty simple instructions. But as you get more hungry, it'd be along the lines of fasting. It's easy to say, I'm going to fast for three days or ten days or whatever the case may be. It's easy to say those things, but then when you start getting hungry, uh, it's a little easier to start backing off on that. So um, maybe the more hungry we get, the more tempted we're going to be to fall for what the guy says, and that's exactly what begins to happen. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you, in this place, I've been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. The old prophet answered. Now, let me, let me just back up there because it's very clear this prophet, this man of God that it says here, number one, it calls him a man of God, so it's, it's that respect for him. But he says, I cannot go back with you. I cannot eat bread. I cannot drink water in this place. And I have been told that by the word of the Lord. So it's very clear what he can do, and it's very clear where he got his instructions from. So he knew that he was not supposed to uh, go back by the way he came, not to eat, not to drink, not to socialize there. Um, and, and, and so that was all understood. And it says, And an angel of the Lord said to me, Well, let me back up. The... Uh, the old prophet answered, I too am a prophet as you are. 
And an angel said to me, <clears throat> excuse me, by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. And so this guy that was probably a respected prophet, the old prophet, we have the words right there, but he was lying to him. And, and we have the other prophet who knew good and well what he was supposed to be doing. It was very clear what he was supposed to be doing. And he even said, by the word of the Lord, I didn't have a dream. I didn't mis mistake what he said. He's saying, I understand no bread, no water, no traveling by the same path. But the old prophet begins to play, and we call it sometimes, he, he plays the God card uh, people who want to say, well, you know, God says this or God says that. We may not say it in a prophetic sense, but we have people say that to us all the time about situations. I, I, had, I talk about renter sometimes. I had a renter that said, well, you know, God expects you to uh, help the poor. And I made the statement, the, the scripture says, if you won't, won't work, a man says, let me back up. God says, if a man won't work, let him not eat. And so people that want to play that God card and throw it at you, and he plays that God card. Well, I'm a prophet too. So you can't just say your prophecy is better than my prophecy, but we know because of that verse it said he's lying. So everything he says to this uh, man of God is a lie. And he says, I hear from God too. And, and the, the problem with that, it is true. Our pastor hears from God. The prophet hears from God, the teacher hears from God, whatever it may be. But the problem is when people begin to say, and it is true, I hear from God too. So because our pastor says, I, hear, I heard from God about this situation, well, I could say, well, I heard from God too, but not in this sense of a sarcastic, uh, situation that, well, I'm just as, what, who are you to tell us what to do? I hear from God too. And, and that's fine if I can say truthfully, if my pastor and I could have a conversation and say, what do we do about this? Because you said you heard from God and I'm hearing something different. We need to figure this out. We need to figure out who's, who's hearing from God here. What, what, what is God speaking to us? but not in a manner where, again, I go out and say to other people, well, you know what, I hear from God too. And then I begin to get people to believe in me because, well, I've been here a long time. You people trust me, don't you? I mean, you've only known Jer Pastor Jeremiah, you know, a couple of years, and he's saying this. Well, who are you going to trust? I'm the old prophet in this. I mean, that's what this guy is. You know, I'm the old prophet. It names him as an old prophet. I hear from God too, and I, I, wanna, I refer to this, every time I talk about this, I refer to Miriam, Moses' sister, who made that statement in Numbers 12.12. 12, it said, She says to Moses, Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? In other words, it was, a, it was a, uh, an issue just like what I talked about, it was a sarcastic, I'm just as good as you are. Why should we listen to you, Moses? Or why should we listen to you, Pastor, about this situation? Why should we listen to that? God speaks to me too, and God didn't tell me that. So why should I listen to you? And let me just remind you of what happened with Miriam. She was stricken with scales like snow. In other words, she was stricken with leprosy immediately. This was not, uh, sometimes you'd say, well, I don't know if that's a direct uh, punishment from God or I don't know if that happened to me because I sinned because three years ago I did this thing and now I'm struggling with something. Well, I can't always look, well, that, that was because I sinned three years ago. That's why that thing came on you. This was instant. It was like, uh, well, it was just like Jeroboam who just stuck his hand out against the prophet and his hand shriveled up. This is the same situation with Miriam. Immediately, she's stricken, stricken with scales like snow. Uh, she was put out of the camp for seven days. And isn't it ironic that we're, uh, right now, we're in a coronavirus quarantine. Some people to different extents, but there are people who are stuck in their houses for the next 
two weeks, 30 days, uh, 14 days. We've heard all kinds of different things with that. But she was taken outside the camp for seven days because she was contagious. Leprosy is contagious. You, you go outside the camp. You can't fellowship with anybody. You can't have contact. I mean, it is so uh, amazing how the Word of God speaks to us at timely manners is talking about uh, Miriam here and what happened to her and the quarantine that she was put under. And we know some of us have not been quarantined like others, but some people are about to lose their mind being stuck uh, in their house. And, and in the, uh, well, let me back up. After this happened, after she was placed outside the camp, she never speaks again. It doesn't mean she couldn't speak. I'm not saying he took away her ability to speak, but she never speaks again. She never, it, we never have a thing that she said to Moses, something else. So she never speaks and has never spoken to or spoken of again until Numbers 20 and 1. So this was uh, in Numbers 12. In the 20th chapter of Numbers, it speaks about her death. And that's the next time she's spoken of. And so there was a serious consequence for making that statement, well, God, I, God speaks to me too. Uh, I'm just as good as you are. I can say the same things you can say. So, and in the, in the Jewish morning prayers, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but there's six, it, it quotes six things to remember. So in other words, if, if we were Jewish and we were reading through our prayers, it talks about six things to remember. And let me just mention one of those. It says, remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the way as you came, came out of Egypt. And so what she had done by speaking against Moses, by speaking those words to Moses, she was struck with leprosy. She was never spoken of. She was never spoken to, or we don't have a record of that. And then it went clear into chapter 20 before it even spoke of her death. And now it's, it's reminding them every day, remember what happened to Miriam. Remember what happened to Miriam. Well, why would you say that? If, if that was so important, why would God uh, uh, emphasize that in their morning prayers? Why would they emphasize that? Because they want to make sure that they don't speak those same words while well, I hear from God too. 13.19, so the man of God returned with him and ate and drank at his home. Uh, he violated all three commands. And I have to wonder in this case, did he... Um, he violated all of those commands. Did he think, did I misunderstand God? Because now this other prophet that is so, um, so much smarter, so much older, so much more wisdom, maybe I misunderstood God. I don't think he, I don't know that he was, well, he was fooled to a certain extent because he understood prior to this pretty clearly what he was supposed to do, what he was not supposed to do. And so, um, he, he didn't practice what he preached. He said the words, I'm not supposed to do this, and then went right ahead and did what he had just said, I'm not supposed to do. Uh, 13, 20 through 22, while they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. He cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. You came back and ate and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat or drink. Therefore, your body will not be buried in the tomb of your fathers. Uh, this, this story is a little bit confusing here because we just have the record of the old prophet. It says he lied. He was lying by having him come back and then it's a strange thing because the, the, it says the word of the Lord came to the old prophet. The old prophet who had just lied, who had just deceived this man of God, now God uses him to speak words against what he had just asked the other guy to come and do. And, and I, I have to think, I try to put these questions, what would I, if I was this man of God who came back, what would I say? I would say, you're the one who asked me to come back. How can you give me this prophecy? It's your fault that I'm here. Why would God judge me? I thought you were the true prophet. Why didn't God reveal to me that you were a false prophet? 
These are all questions when, when we begin to get punished, we begin to want to blame someone else. Instead of just saying, you're absolutely right, I have defied the word of God, I've gone against what God... But instead, I would, most people would begin to make excuse and begin to blame God. Why doesn't God just speak to me? Why didn't he have to tell you I'm a prophet? Why do you have to tell the other prophet to tell this prophet? Why couldn't I just do it? And, and why, why didn't God talk to me? Uh, is it really that big of a deal that I just ate and drank something? And again, we try to, we try to reason why God doesn't want us to do something, which is a, a terrible thing for us to do. Why can't we just say, God said no, and leave it at that? But my questions, and, and maybe this prophet would say, well, yeah, I came back here and I ate and drank, but what's the big deal? I did this little sin, but what's the big deal? And it says, when the man of God, verse 23 and 24, when the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet who had brought him back saddled his donkey for him. As he went on his way, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his body was thrown down on the road with both the donkey and the lion standing beside it. You would have thought, I mean, it says after he finished eating, you would have thought he probably would have said, after those words coming from that prophet, I'm, I'm out of here. I don't want to stay here any longer. I've already messed up. I don't want to stay here any longer. But the, the miraculous thing here that, that happens in this, well, number one, it's miraculous that something would happen so suddenly that that man would die. That's not what the prophet said. He just said, you won't be buried in the tomb of your fathers. But he didn't warn him that all this stuff was going to happen. I don't think the, the old prophet knew either. But it, the miraculous part of it is that the lion killed him but didn't eat him. You know, lions don't kill for sport generally. They kill for food. And then the lion killed the man but didn't kill the donkey. I mean, he could have had that food. There could have been other lions. Generally, lions run in uh, packs or herds or whatever you call it. I don't know what you call it with lions. But, um, it, you know, and the reason God allows some of these things to happen like this is because and we're going to see where people came by and the people that came by saw what was going on and looked at it as a, as a miracle. And the miracle is God's mercy. And we can say, well, what kind of mercy is it? Just the fact that he didn't eat him. Well, there was going to be a body to bury. In other words, he's not going to devour him. He's not going to uh, rip him to pieces or whatever. He doesn't kill the donkey. And, and people would see that as they come, come by. He didn't eat, he didn't eat him. The lion became a guard for the body, and the donkey could carry him back. And so, even in God's plan, you know, God allowed this to happen. We talk about that allowed, allow, allowing or causing. God allowed this uh, to happen to this guy, but then in his mercy, doesn't the lion doesn't devour him. The donkey doesn't get killed, so that they're able to put the, the man on the donkey, and that's part of the uh, story coming up, but he'll be able to put the man on the donkey and bring him back. And I, I just want to make I want to make one statement here. And, and again, I've said this many times: we all die for our sin. That's that is that happened from the Garden of Eden. You're going to die, and it's because of sin. And we can say we can blame it on Adam, we can blame it on Eve or whatever, but we die because we live in a sinful world. And so in, in this case, this man died for his sin, but he died instantly. Ananias and Sapphira died instantly. They grieved the Holy Spirit. They blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Why would you lie to the Holy Spirit is what it said. So with Ananias and Sapphira, we can say, man, that was sure a, a, a strange thing that God killed them right away. But what we can say is we all die in our sin. We just don't know when. We don't know that it was one thing, and I don't know that it was one thing for Ananias and Sapphira. It was probably a, an attitude or a lifestyle in their case. For this guy, he seems like a man of God, and it seems like we don't have a lot of other words about his prophecies. It's like this one prophecy, this one thing that he was required to do. 
And, and I, I want to say that about the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy does not mean when we're given a gift of the prophetic, a gift of healing, a gift of miracles, a gift of tongues, interpretation, prophecy. You go through all those gifts. When we're given those gifts, those gifts may not be for eternity. <laughs> I might, God may uh, instill in me at one time the gift of a message in tongues, and I may never do that again. Not because God's displeased, but because he needed me in that moment to, to function in that gift. The gift of, of the prophetic, whatever it may be. The gift of, of miracles, of praying over someone. Uh, you know, you pray over someone and they're healed instantly. And all of a sudden, you think you've got the gift of healing. Or other people look at you like, you must have some special power given by God because when you prayed, they were healed. You know, 500 other people prayed for them and they weren't healed, but when you prayed for them, they were healed. God can use us in a, in a gift of His Spirit on a one-time basis. We don't know anything about that other prophet. We don't know if this was only a one-time uh, instance that he was used or whether he'd been used many times and this is just the only one recorded. But it very well could be but that that prophet up to that time had lived a godly life, was used by God, and then God was finished with him. And because of his disobedience, maybe God decided he couldn't use him anymore. After that disobedient, he, he, God might have been, you've done right up to this point, but this is telling a story about who you are. You won't be faithful to me. You won't do what I said, even though you made a statement. This came by the word of the God. And I'll read one more verse and we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Some people who passed by, and this is exactly what I said here, there was a reason why that donkey stood there. There was a reason why that lion stood there. Some people who passed by saw the body thrown down there with the lion standing beside the body and they went and reported it in the city where the old prophet lived. So they went back, uh, back there. This, uh, again, those people who passed by had to be impressed by what had happened here that this is not a normal situation. I'm sure they passed by and saw that lion standing there, maybe had some fear that that lion, lion would attack someone else, but they had to be thinking this is a strange situation, that this lion has killed this man, but he didn't maul him, he didn't eat him, devour him, and did nothing to this donkey standing there. I, I've kind of got that picture in my head of this body laying on the ground with a lion on one side and a donkey on the other side, and uh, that had to be just the strangest looking situation as those people walked by and they reported it to the city and we'll, we'll go on from there uh, about what happens with the old prophet there and how he uh, reacts to that. So we'll stop there for today and I hope to see you soon. Uh, besides on this camera, I hope we can get back live at some point. So God bless you today.